ich habe es jetzt an und genau würde einfach mal ein bisschen was erzählen. Test, 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 test. 
Vielleicht ein bisschen lauter reden, aber eigentlich muss ich nicht hören. We'll start in, in two minutes or three minutes, hopefully. <laughs> We're experiencing some, um, some technical difficulties with the online stream, so sorry for that. Um, hope to get it fixed. Okay, probieren wir jetzt nochmal, ob man jetzt was hört. Jetzt müsste dann vielleicht gleich was rauskommen. Eigentlich. Eigentlich müsste es. Ja, das sind wir gerade mal ausgesteckt. Um es hier rüber zu machen. War noch nichts? Und dann Test, Test im Anschluss. Das ist ja da. Aber es ist auch eine Audio-Anstellung. Nee, also genau. Ich habe da vorne mit dem anderen Mikro das Ding ja gerade noch, habe ich ja alles gefilmt. Ich habe da mit dem Doppel zu sein. Stand sozusagen auch Das Ding ist, also wir können natürlich jetzt ganz schnell wieder nehmen, wir müssen uns einen neuen Anfang stellen und wir müssen jetzt so einen Buch laufen. Genau, Joschka, wenn wir das nochmal mit dem probieren. Wenn Sie das haben. Dann ist nur, ja, genau. Aber dann muss es doch online übertragen werden. Genau. Am Ende müssen wir dann uns hin und her rennen, aber das ist ja egal. Ja, ja, das ist ist ein ein Leute Leute genau. Aber gibt es hier nicht ein zweites Mikro? Zahl Mikro dann. Hier sind noch immer noch zwei Mikro. Ist auch noch so. Und jetzt müsste es eigentlich funktionieren. Kommt immer noch nichts an? Das Video ist da. Genau. Oder man sieht auch uns, Marike. Willst du auch noch mal kurz über deinen Laptop auf den ja. Livestream? Ich gucke uns gar nicht zu. Ja. Das ist denn heiser, ne? Aber das ist ja dieses so. ja, das ja, Gerät. Ja, ja. Ne? Hallo, Mareike. Hallo, Mareike. Dann probieren wir es jetzt nochmal. Wenn du das genau hörst, was ich sage, ist es gut. <lacht> 
Okay. And now it works. This works. Okay. It would be very dark, though. Um, a very warm welcome, um, and I'm really sorry for the delay. Um, we have had some issues with our microphone that just died on us. So now we're switching to this one, um, and I'll ask you to speak into this mic. Um, it's not for the room, it's for our online audience, um, who I'm welcoming also very much. Um, thanks for joining us here in the room and live on the, on the live stream for our um, lecture within the lecture series of the Research Center Transformations of Political Violence. Um, that I'm co-organizing with my colleague Felix Andal. My name is Mariel Rice. I work, or we both work at the Center for Conflict Studies here at the University of Marburg. Um, and we are very, very pleased um, to have Jenny Pierce here with us today. Um, Jenny Pierce is a um, professor at the London School of Economics um, at the Latin America and Caribbean Center. Um, she's a political science, scientist who specializes in Latin America. She works with anthropological and participatory research methodologies on social change, violence, um, security, power and participation in the region and beyond. Her research has centered on understanding participation and social agency for change, theorizing violence and security in Latin America, the impact of violence on agency and action, and theorizing violence. Um, she has conducted field work since the 1970s already in Uruguay, El Salvador, Guatemala, Colombia, Mexico, Chile, Brazil, and Venezuela. Um, among her many um, seminal publications are um, her books published in 1981 already under the Eagle, United States um, Intervention in Central America and the Caribbean, and the 1986 um, publication Promised Land, um, among her many publications, and I will uh, just name these two. Um, um, her current research focuses on um, particularly on the role of elites and violence in Latin America. She's working with young researchers in Colombia on elites and the peace accord. The research is funded by the um, Instituto Colombo Aleman para la Paz, and I'm sorry for pronouncing this wrong, um, and Capaz is actually a very um, good bridge um, again also to trace because there's um, a colleague uh, who works with us in Trace, um, Stefan Peters, who's the academic director of CAPAS, um, and another bridge is our dear colleague Annika Oetler here at the center, um, who suggested to invite you. So thank you so much, Annika, for this, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're very much looking forward to hear from you on violence in Latin American politics, um, and the floor is yours. Well, and thank you very much for the invitation because I particularly liked this idea of new perspectives on violence and transformations of political violence. And so this is a great opportunity to have uh, a serious discussion. The topic is complex and the topic is painful. And I'm very aware of how painful this topic is. And if anyone finds it too painful, I totally understand if you have to leave because Etienne Bellebar, a famous French philosopher, he said how difficult it is for human beings to face up to violence. And I think he's absolutely right. There's something prevents us having a deep and meaningful discussion about what we understand about violence. So I'm going to just give you, first of all, my key argument so that you know where we're going. <laughs> it's the kind of destiny of some kind. Uh, so it gives you a sense of, of what I'm trying to kind of communicate here. Um, so I talk about a post Weberian enlightenment, right? So your famous son of Germany, Max Weber, and uh, uh, I'm looking towards how I'm a great fan of Weber. He's a brilliant guy, but I feel that what he's given us is not adequate for what we're facing in the world today. And so part of what I'm very interested in is how do we rethink 
Und es ist das Wort an Okay. Okay. So to just just to continue, loud voice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not to worry. I always thought in person would be less technologically demanding, but no, it's kind of these things happen. Don't worry. Um, so I was talking about the post-rational enlightenment and the need for an emotional enlightenment of the twenty-first century. Um, and that means we face up to violence and the factors of its reproduction in order to strengthen social and political action on these factors. That's also a complicated sentence, right? It's to say we're not going to change the world, right, if people are fearful, living in various forms of violence, and if violence continues to be, for instance, the potential way in which those who have access to its means will determine who survives climate change. So basically, if we want to begin social action for change, we must recognize violence is, is as important as climate change. And that we have to start understanding that violence in order to act on the factors which generate it. So it's again, another iterative sentence. And final argument, all violences matter. We know so much today about their reproduction that we could reduce violence and enhance agency for violence reducing change. This is a big argument that not everyone will recognize, but uh, in my view, having gone through a lot of conversations with different disciplines, I'm convinced we know enough about violence if we have the will to actually do something about it. Okay, we now have another problem, is it won't? No, it's working. Yeah, but I can't see it here. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Okay. So just to sort of, you know, bring the Weberian issue into, into focus a bit more. Um, this was what Weber said. Oh, hang on. Sorry. Yeah. Today we have to say that a state is a, and it's covering the, the quote, and I can't remember. Oh. <laughs> Can we move the, yes. the the green line? Yeah. Maybe here. Yeah. Yeah. The state is a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. I've been so struck by how the sentence in German, physische Gewaltsamkeit, is translated as force, not as violence. And this is part of a whole linguistic semantic problem we have with what Weber has kind of given us and how it's being translated. And but keep that idea of what he's saying in the head. Now it won't go again. <laughs> it won't move when I press that. Oh. Yeah. So this quote is, I think, the, the kind of key quote from Politics as Vocation, which is the lecture that Weber gave in Munich in 2019. I tried to publish my book exactly 100 years later, but I made it in 2020. It wasn't too bad. But this quote, um, he who seeks the salvation of the soul of his own and of others should not seek it along the avenue of politics. So if you want to transform things, you want to save the world, you don't do it through politics. For the quite different tasks of politics can only be solved by violence. The genius or demon of politics lives in an inner tension with the God of love. The tension can at any time lead to an irreconcilable conflict. So we have this, this idea embedded in Weber that actually politics will always have to include the use of violence. That you, and that's what he was trying to tell the, uh, the young actors with their utopian ideals in 2019 to change Germany, to transform Germany in a more socialist direction. Actually, you've got to be realistic and, you know, you're never going to have a, a country which, uh, which doesn't have to deal with violence and the vocation of politics is to recognize that. 
So we have a really important link here with politics as vocation and politics uh, and political violence. We have to ask whether that actually involves political violence to think that the state must use violence, right? Because that's what politics will inevitably bring about. So that's a big question. So this is how I'm going to develop the argument, right? I'm gonna develop in three blocks. There's quite a lot of uh, information. And so, and it's uh, late on, a, on a, a, a cold winter evening, and uh, I want to give you time to sort of reflect on the arguments. And so what I'm planning to do is to kind of divide it into these three blocks. And the first one will ask politics without violence, question mark, Weberian and counter Weberian logic. So something a bit more conceptual, right? About how we understand it, but it's gonna be illustrated. So it's not gonna be, I hope, lots of text. So uh, it should, should be a little bit more in building of the imagination. The second block will be the phenomenon of violence, a thinking tool, right? So how actually could we arrive at something which would help us think about this phenomenon? And then we will go to violences in Latin American politics and what can we learn? So the idea is that with these instruments of thinking, we can actually both learn what Latin America is telling us about violence, but we can also bring that thinking to Latin American realities. So, and at the end of each block, I'm going to sort of give you two or three minutes just to think, right? I will put out a question, but uh, the question isn't necessarily the question that will interest you. You can decide your own questions, but I'm going to put out a question for reflection and just give you that time to just think about how you stand in relation to what I'm saying. So that when we have the final proper discussion at the end, you've already got some ideas in your head and, you know, counter arguments or whatever. So, Violence and politics, right? So in a way, Weber seems to have been confirmed because this is uh, Africa, Southern Africa, and the extraordinary levels of violence that accompanies voting in different parts of Africa, Kenya, Uganda, there's been extraordinary levels of violence. But it's not just the global South. Um, I'd actually forgotten that uh, Shinju Abe of the, uh, Japan had been assassinated this year, Japan, right? And of course, you all know about the, the violence took place with the seizing of the capital uh, uh, after the rejection of the uh, US election results. And so that's given us something, right? This isn't just about play in the global South, right? There's something going on here about where, what role does violence play? Again, we might think Abel was right, right? And then we have kind of the, the emergence of new debates about how violence enters politics with social media. We have something now in my country in England that is called hate crime, right? And we have had two uh, parliamentarians killed in the last few years, something extraordinary, right? And so it's something's also happening in my country. We still might think Weber's right. And then Haiti, people might think absolutely he's right because Haiti now doesn't have a state, right? And you have, this week has been absolutely horrendous for, for Haitian people. There's something about 60 groups, gangs that control Port-au-Prince. And the levels of violence are something truly appalling. And we're talking about horrendous kidnappings, but it's even worse than that. It's also, if anything, it could be worse, rape in front of your children, in front of your, your husband. Um, there's something going on in Haiti. And I put this other slide, which is this sort of historical reflection of the Toussaint Louverture slave revolt that made Haiti independence, because simply because when that happened, Haiti was a target for destroy Haiti no matter what, for having had a successful slave revolt. So there's a whole discussion about you know, what has happened in Haiti. But, and it's very live at this moment, and I think it uh, gives us lots of food for thought about what happens and why what happens happens when you have what is actually the collapse of a, of a, of a state. And then we have a sort of another question. So on the one hand, we have, Weber seems to be getting it right, right? We can't live without a state. People will just be violent towards each other, uh, a, a violent monopolizing state. We can't... Um, Basically, this is the politics is still totally permeated by use of violence. But what happens when the state itself interprets what violence is and does so in a way 
which responds to violence in society with its own violence, right? And this is Bukele in El Salvador. For many people, he's done a wonderful thing. He's stopped the violence. He's actually gone and imprisoned the gangs, thousands and thousands of them, right? In humiliating, horrific conditions. This is a politician using the use of violence. And I consider the conditions in which he's keeping these, these guys in prison to be a tantamount to a form of torture. But he's doing this because it's politically incredibly profitable. And so here again, well, maybe he was right, Weber. And here we have Iran. And here the story begins to get a little bit more complicated. You know, here we have women, a woman who is, and this ha has happened quite a lot. We don't know all the story of what's going on in Iran, but we do know that a woman was uh, basically beaten to death, right, for not wearing the, the veil. And, um, but the other picture below the picture, of Masa is the picture of what happens to women in the intimate space of their home quite often. There's something else going on here. There's the violence the state considers, right? It can use because it wants to set about a certain behavior of women. And then there's what that means for the violence in society that is talked less about, which is the incredible level of uh, intimate space violence. And then, so the state can actually start to be using violence in a, in a much more proactive way than perhaps we have been uh, sort of thinking about because we so believe that the state must monopolize the violence legitimately under rules. This is my country again, this is England. So what happens when agents of the state actually turn out to have an incredible level of misogyny to the extent in this case, Sarah Everard was just walking home in London when this policeman, policeman stopped in the London Metropolitan Police, stopped her and he said she wasn't by obeying the rules of COVID. And so he had to come accompany with her, in, uh, accompany, accompany him in the car. He took her in the car. He then raped her and murdered her. There is now an extraordinary debate in the London Metropolitan Police, not only about the sexism that allowed someone who had actually had a history of a lot of misogynist remarks, but also about how much there was a communication amongst WhatsApp groups in the police and how much that included hostility to gay and lesbians and to, uh, to, to black population. And so, something in that institution of the police, right? A state police widely recognized as one of the most developed in the world, police force, kind of the whole idea of the police sort of emerged with Robert Peel in, 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 in England. And here we have the London police force now under special measures. So what is going on there? And of course you all know about the Black Lives Matter and the fact that it took 200 years after the abolition of slavery, more than 200 years, for it to become possible for the society to say it's not right for policemen to kill a black man. I mean, when you actually really reflect on that, it's so incredibly extraordinary. And of course, he wasn't the only black man. He's been many, many, many. And so there's been like at least a recognition of that. Okay, so is this violence? This is Alan Kurdi, who was a, a young boy, Syrian refugee, washed up on shore in 2015. And the world noted, right? However, we have let over 10,000 migrants die in the Mediterranean. We are still letting many migrants be violated, killed, tortured, arrested in uh, crossing the borders into the United States. In my country, you might have heard, our Home Secretary wanted to take migrants to Rwanda and has allowed them to kind of, they, you know, they come across the sea and in horrendous conditions. Now, what, you know, what is this? Is this? If the state lets people die, is that violence, right? So how do we think about that? And then we have issues about how our understanding of violence changes. This is the, really the hopeful conversation. It's that actually it's hopeful and not totally hopeful, right? But um, rape in war was normal, right? It's normal, but we didn't know that. We didn't recognize it. We didn't sort of talk about it until in the Bosnian war in the early 90s, there was mass rape. And because by then there was a feminist movement that could name it, and that's a very important issue to name it, 
So people began to recognize there is such a thing as rape in war. It's not just, war is just not about soldiers. It's also about what's done to the bodies of women. And so this has led to a kind of really interesting legal shift in terms of recognizing international crime. However, we know what's going on in Ukraine. And we know that rape has been used systematically in Ukraine. Okay, so lots to take in there. <laughs> I want a little sort of two minute sort of personal individual reflection, or you can talk to somebody as well. Just two minutes, won't be long, I'm afraid. And this is the question that I kind of thought would be worth thinking about, but you can think about any question you like, you know. Violence is a state monopoly. Is that part of the solution or part of the problem? I need two minutes. <laughs> Okay, hold those thoughts. <laughs> and at the end, you know, we'll have a wider discussion. So now I want to get on to, well, okay. Okay, so it'll be interesting to hear what you think about whether the monopoly is a salute part of the solution or part of the problem. But essentially we're talking about the monopoly of violence, but do we actually agree on what we mean by violence, right? Is there actually something that we, we can agree on? So I now want to sort of, raise these issues around violence as a phenomenon and uh, bearing in mind what Einstein said we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them it feels that it's time to rethink violence and uh, it sounds a ridiculous thing to say of course we've been rethinking violence haven't we but I feel that actually we haven't yet quite got there <laughs> and the, the evidence for that is what's going on in the world today and we'll talk more about that so, well, okay, so what is the problem of violence exactly, right? We know that violence has multiple expressions. Um, however, I'm arguing that nevertheless, we can understand it as a phenomenon with its own distinctions. There's something about violence that we need to understand, something about what violence is about. We tend, I argue, to select the violences that matter to us, right? So hence, political violence is what matters to those who are thinking in terms of the state, right? What the state must do when it monopolizes is prevent any groups within society challenging the power of the state, right? And so uh, that understanding of violence is the selection or it's the political violence that really we're worried about. And so that's dominated a lot of political science thinking, but I think it's dominated on common sense thinking. And that's the worst thing that can happen. So when I was trying to sort of look into this, I found that only an interdisciplinary lens could help me to understand violence. So I've been talking to all sorts of disciplines uh, through, obviously through biography, through literature, 
um, and having discussions which were not possible a few decades ago. A uh, social scientist could not talk to a natural scientist. And uh, now I'm pleased to say we can, and not only that, we can learn what is the phenomenon of violence. So first of all, let's me start with the political scientists and many historians who've been concerned with violence within politics, and they've been very concerned with order. And we do know, you know, lots of work on the violent histories of state formations. And Weber was very influenced by Thomas Hobbes. Um, and Thomas Hobbes, who wrote just after the English Civil War uh, in the mid 17th century, and Weber wrote just after the First World War in the early 20th century. And so when we're thinking their heads are in that moment of thinking war, and so Hobbes gave us this notion, and there's a lot of sophistication in Hobbes. So, um, you know, when you actually read him, but the way he's been read is that basically, if we don't give up our liberty to the Leviathan, to the state, we are doomed to continue to use violence against each other. So it's a good of the, the, the argument that actually we need the state. The state is part of the solution. That's very much the argument. And then we have the fact that in Europe, at least, we had a, a huge struggle, right, to do what Weber captures, which is at the end of the day, yes, the state monopolizes violence, but it must do so under legal rules. So how do we get legal rules? And actually the history of um, Europe agreeing to the rule of law is another huge, long and complicated history. The very good uh, historian of this, Manuel Eisner, he uh, puts forward the fact that in Oxford in the, I think it's the 12th century, there was many duels between the rich and the poor. So using violence, man on man was the way you solve things. And gradually what began to happen is, uh, the wealthy began to see their interests lie more in the resolution of the conflicts between them. And so they began to sort of give up some of their power to the third party who would adjudicate their conflicts. And over hundreds of years, and it has to be said this, we have something we could call the rule of law and it does matter, it really does, right? But when you actually look, and I'm summarizing a lot of uh, very lengthy uh, uh, research here, um, the reduction, it led to the reduction of interpersonal male on male violence. Why do I say that? Because the homicide rate now in Europe is less than two per 100,000. In Latin America, it's on average 28 per 100,000. So you have to acknowledge something, something stopped the inter -male, interpersonal male on male violence. However, of course, it did not stop violence between states. It did not stop the colonial violence. It did not stop my country torturing people in Kenya during the Mau Mau rebellion, uh, just the mid last century. It, so basically, we, we, um, what exactly the violence that was dealt with, but nevertheless, one cannot ignore the fact that that interpersonal male on male violence, something was achieved, right? But we have to talk about that a, mo a lot more. But what happened as well was that line between violences that are political and violences that could be considered social began to limit our understanding of violence. So if we don't have violence, interpersonal male and male violence, then okay, we've addressed violence in Europe, haven't we? But actually when we begin to delve deeper into what is going on, we realize that we, we haven't dealt with violence and I've already showed you some evidence of that. When I look uh, and taught and read lots of philosophers. And I do think it's very interesting that when we sort of discuss um, violence, we tend to do so from silos. You know, we tend to sort of do it through a disciplinary lens. And it, I really feel that violence like peace, they're topics that cannot be solved or thought about without dis discussions between different ways of thinking about the world, different knowledge systems, right? And so philosophy gives us so much to understand about violence, particularly phenomenology. And phenomenology draws attention to our sense-making selves and also to the embodiment of that. They're extremely rich in insights into how the body and the sense-making evolves and takes place. But they also question some of the assumptions we might have. Even Hannah Arendt, who I'm a great admirer of, she thinks violence is instrumental. But actually, when you begin to look at the sense that violence offers, you begin to realize, in fact, 
that actually violence can be an end as well as a means. And I, this came home to me a lot when I was, when the whole period of the suicide bombing and the whole period of the, the kind of what was going on in, in, in the Middle East. And then we had some terrible, terrible moments in my country, in France, etc. And beginning to realize that there was a generation of young men, particularly men from, um, from, uh, from Muslim men, who felt that dying and dying with others, right, making others die, was the meaning they wanted in life. It gave them meaning. And it feels to me that that notion that violence can actually give you a sense of yourself and it horrifies us. But let's face it, violence also has an impact on giving us pleasure. And it's hard to acknowledge that. But when you look at how we, many of us have uh, transposed our fear of violence, our dislike of violence into entertainment, way back in history, that was probably one of the first things that happened when uh, um, you, you had the gladiators and uh, you put Christians to sort of fight in Rome and basically became a sport almost. And now we've had, you know, sport is actually a rule-based uh, approach to inter-male tension, one could say. I'm not going to say women don't like football, but it, it, there's something, you know, there's a whole lovely uh, book by Norberto Elias on uh, sport and violence, and it's kind of very illuminating. And then obviously film and literature you know, there are ways in which we kind of, you know, address the violences that are always around us by uh, distancing ourselves and turning it into something pleasurable. And so I think this is another debate. So that violence can actually, in a way, liberate us subjectively. It can affirm oneself and give us meaning in life. And I think this is, for me, the only way you could begin to really understand the potency of violence. But what this doesn't mean is that it's inevitable. And I think this is the big question uh, in terms of you know, how we can actually address violence. And it's here that discussions with natural scientists, with biologists, with psychologists, psychotherapists, psychoanalysts, gives you a real insight in how the biological body is also a social body, right? And biologists now recognize that that aggression is not the same as violence. Aggression is natural. And it's something that we often need because we're attacked and so you want to respond. But how do you stop that aggression becoming something more and turning into uh, to violence? And our capacity to respond to attacks without aggression really grows with the emotional experiences embodied in our memories. And this is really something very powerful that has come from so many uh, natural scientists. Susan Gerhardt's written a wonderful book, which is basically Love Makes the Brain, which is how serotonin, which we need to respond to attacks without further attacking and violence, turning that into violence, that serotonin grows with the first love the baby receives from the parents. And so this doesn't mean that if you don't receive love, you are obviously inevitably going to, to use violence. But when you actually read the impacts on the vulnerable body that come from experiences from childhood you know, and onwards, you begin to realize how significant these are in terms of how we address violence. And this is something I think we could all recognize. Revenge is so connected to the use of violence. I've been, I've talked with paramilitary in Colombia and talked them out, oh, and what was revenge? Ah, yeah, you rendir cuentas. Yes, you just, you've got to always fight back, you know? And it's something in all languages. You know, it's sweet, revenge, because it really is sweet. When someone hurts you, you feel great when that person is hurt. And so these emotional circuits in our body, which enable us to feel that, and this quote here, I'll be quick on this. And how am I doing for time, by the way? Just so I, yeah, good. So violence is the failure to respect the boundary between acceptable and unacceptable aggression. If we want to prevent this breakdown, to have people reserve their strongest responses for true emergencies, we must protect the nervous system from injury 
destabilizing levels of stress, drugs, isolation and victimization. We must strive to create a safe environment, flexible enough to accommodate some risk taking, structured enough to prevent confusion. Behavior is developed, not determined. And because social behaviors like aggression lie at the cutting edge of adaptation to the environment, they are among the behavioral elements most open to change. And this is extremely important because, you know, what the natural sciences are telling us is these, what we know means we could change our behaviors. We could change this now that we know so much. And then when I talk to the psychologists and social psychologists, there are now so many studies on the relational roots of aggression. The work of John Bowlby on the theory of attachment, which is that it's so important to have as you grow up, uh, someone you can rely on, you know is always gonna look after you no matter what happens. And that attachment, when there's a rupture in that attachment has huge impacts on the body and your sense of whether you can, can be confident in the world. And these, this again does not predict that someone who has a rupture in their attachments is going to be violent. But what it shows is that from the, the research that's been done, how much it does impact. And if we're not aware of the impact, that trajectory is a potential trajectory. And so only recently the process through which trauma and attachment ruptures impact on the future use of violence have been recognized. For me, one of the great advances is that now in England, people talk about mental health as being a natural part of what we should all be thinking about. And they don't talk about it as an aberration or you're mad or whatever, you know, but it becomes something important. And of course, now people are realizing, and I haven't got time to go into the issue of language and how language hurts, but social media impacts, and that's that new idea of the hate crime, right? How that actually does impact on the vulnerable body. And then and I'm coming to the end of this part now. Sociology and anthropology move us from the individual into the social and the cultural. So we have actually very different norms across cultures as to what we think violence is. And the example I give is like in my lifetime, my brothers were beaten at school. Child punishment was acceptable and it still is in many parts of the world. But now we've begun to see it as child abuse. And we began to see that that physical use of, of, of violence towards a child in the name of changing his behavior or her behavior, it actually contributes to emotional ruptures. And that can have a, a huge impact on the future. And all that I've said now, is also so linked to the fact that men experience this very much more deeply than women. And I, a very important thing here, I don't think the problem is men, right? The problem is masculinities. And there's a statistic that I think is one of the most important statistic, and for some reason it doesn't seem to be taken very seriously, but 90% of homicides in the world, this is from 2017, 90% of the homicides in the world are committed by young men. Like basically, you know, about, around about 16 to 24, and then there's another range, 24 to 44. 80% of the victims are young men of the same age. Now, how we understand what is going on there seems to me absolutely critical if we're going to start thinking about violence. And just to give an idea to illustrate that, uh, could we perhaps see Putin? and humiliated masculinities um, by what happened, uh, you know, as we know, with the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and it's very interesting to note that in 2017, not that long before the invasion of Ukraine, they decriminalized domestic violence in Russia. And something we know, you know, that's why the figures here, the pictures here, the invasion of Ukraine has been, is, is such a masculinized phenomenon in the bombardment of Ukraine's maternity hospital, the use of rape. Again, it's not about men, it's about how you understand masculinity. So I come now to sort of how I came to my thinking tool. So the thinking tool for violence then, because uh, for me, what comes out so much is the meaning the meaning that is attached to violence, it gives its potency. So meaning bearing and meaning generating acts and actions of somatic harm, harm on the body, that potentially constitute, normalize and or destroy social orders. 
That is my thinking tool. Obviously, there's a lot more to say, which we don't have time for. But I wanted to obviously, when I go into Latin America, to look a lot more at this, what I mean by meaning. And so another question for reflection, two minutes, and then I will get, get turn to Latin America. So the meanings of violence and the meanings it generates. How does thinking in terms of the phenomenon of violence change or not the way we might imagine politics and the state? If we actually did take the idea of violence as a phenomenon with multiple expressions, but actually it's the phenomenon we need to understand. And that thinking tool is to sort of help us to think. It is only a thinking tool. There's probably not a definition. It's a thinking tool to debate, to discuss. You know, does that make sort of sense to think of it as meaning generating? So two minutes. And feel free to talk to your neighbor or whoever. Okay, let's press on and let's travel to Latin America. <laughs> uh, violence is in Latin American politics. What can we learn? So part, part of this is about learning from Latin America, as well as whether or not these ideas have any relevance to helping us to understand Latin America. And first of all, I hate, I have to tell you, I really don't like using statistics with violence because they distance ourselves from what it actually means. And, uh, but it's hard to avoid because it's such a, there's such an intent to measure, to compare which countries are more violent, which regions are more violent. And usually the idea of homicide is the measure. And I have to say, I, I feel very uh, uneasy about it. So I'll talk more about that in a minute, but anyway. What we, but I'm going to have to do it for this first bit, just to give you an idea of why Latin America can teach us about violence and, and how Latin American politics can teach us about the reproduction of violence. So I think, first of all, this, this diagram is simply to show um, how the number of events linked to political violence is growing in Latin America. This um, has been a 10% increase uh, from 2018 to 2021 in social conflict and political violence. Um, and I, you don't have to read all those details, but just to sort of highlight a few things, you know, uh, in Argentina, Vice President Fernandez de Kirchner was almost assassinated. Not she wasn't, she managed to escape uh, this year. Um, and this is about political violence as well. So I'm using an expression of violence only here. Um, in Brazil, between 2016 and 2020, 327 cases of political violence. Uh, in Colombia, 751 cases of violence against social, political, and community leaders, as well as former FARC guerrillas. Um, in Mexico, which is extraordinary, I just come back from both Colombia and Mexico, and I was in Tierra Caliente, Michoacan, in Mexico, and the levels of assassinations are totally extraordinary. And uh, in this particular place where I've been, there's a standoff between two cartels. Um, and at the moment, there's what we call a tense calm, but a tense calm that could rupture at any moment. And uh, everyone knows what that means. And during the process of the confrontations, there were some uh, 6,000 forced displacements. And the, we, we work on an observatory of human security that's developed by people within Apatingan and to actually persuade the state of Mexico to accept that these were forced displacements and not simply, oh, well, they always migrate from Michoacan, so it's just migration, isn't it? No, again, it's naming and saying, you know, no, 
this is not just migration. These people have been literally forced to flee. It's that or die. And so we've now got a, a table to talk about forced displacement in Mexico, but the levels are very, very high. And if you just look at electoral violence in Mexico, uh, and, you know, and Mexico is part of the OECD, right? Mexico is considered a democracy. It is considered part of the nations, the democratic nations. In just that election, 2020 to 2021, 101 murders of politicians. What's, what's so sort of dramatic is that you know, none of this really gets absorbed. We don't really sort of really think through what is going on in politics that you can kill 101 politicians and it's still considered, the country is still considered democracy. So what value do we give to violence, you know, when we are uh, talking about that? Latin America, and this is a very well-known statistic. Again, I sort of, you know, don't really like repeating it, but it's kind of the one you'll hear most, but it is very telling. Uh, home to just 8% of the world's population, 33% of its homicides. Only four countries in the region, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Venezuela, account for a quarter of all the murders on earth. Of the 20 countries in the world with the highest murder rates, 17 are Latin American, as are 43 of the top 50 cities. So we have a crisis of violence in Latin America, a crisis of huge proportion in which we don't seem to be able to take on board to kind of all these different violences. We can even deny that uh, forced displacement is actually associated with violence. Um, and so, you know, the difficulty of naming this. Well, these two slides I'm now going to give you are because I've lived this since, since the 70s and please don't calculate my age. And uh, I have uh, been working on uh, these violences of different kinds. And what struck me so much is in the 70s and 80s, we talked about political violence. That was, the, that was the issue, the dictatorships and the guerrilla insurgencies. And so that was everyone, oh, Latin America, that's where political violence is so intense. We learned about a phenomenon that has accompanied me on all my field visits to Latin America, which is disappearance, which is a, one of the reasons I don't like the use of homicides because people count bodies. And in actual fact, what has happened in Latin America is the bodies now disappear. And that has a message, remember, the, the, the meaning generating. It's a message to disappear a body, not just to the person who disappears and eventually is killed, usually, but also to the family. You know, the notion that you, you the, the mothers in Mexico, so, but I've, I've been with mothers of disappeared people throughout Latin America. And that sense of, you know, where, what hap has happened to the body of my loved one is so extraordinary that uh, it's, it's, I'm amazed that it hasn't, you know, we don't discuss it, but it's, it's a real issue in the region. This is the war in El Salvador. So we've also had, Latin America is not known as a region of wars, but there have been some really, there have been some wars between states, but not, nothing like we've had in Europe, nothing at all. But you have had civil wars of which El Salvador, Guatemala, Colombia, you know, and uh, I was I was present at this war doing an oral history of the peasant movement. So it is very, very sort of alive in my mind what happens in wartime. And then there came a point in the 90s when the literature amongst academics said, ah, it's no longer political violence that we're facing. What we're facing now is social violence, right? So somehow we had a sort of leap of analysis to the idea that actually the nature of the violence has shifted. And um, although these social biases get much less attention, in fact, there's some people here who are part of a special issue we did <laughs> on non-war violences learning from Latin America, precisely because we wanted to draw attention to the fact that there are violences outside of war that are still violences and are violence. And it's another reason why the idea of the phenomenon of violence needs to me to be put on the agenda because if we select the violence, it's, oh, it's a war violence. So that's one thing, we react in a certain way. But actually, when you're in the areas of normal violence, this is Medellin in Colombia, where I've spent many decades. And this is an area where young guys, you will have heard of it, I'm sure you've all saw, you've seen Narcos, and uh, you've understood Pablo Escobar and his role. Pablo Escobar was recruited uh, and turned many young men into assassins, uh, sicarios. 
And, uh, but uh, there was a moment in the 2000s, I can't go into all the details of what went on when the, the local uh, mayor began to sort of try a new approach to the violences and Medellin got this, this idea of being a model of reducing violences. But when, this is Comuna Trece, the 13th commune where I spent a lot of time, uh, it's here when first of all, before that moment, President Uribe mounted an operation called Operation Orion. I was there just after that operation in which um, he allied with paramilitary groups and they essentially disappeared 300 young men. And uh, one of the paramilitary leaders subsequently said they were buried in a place called El Escobeda. In the, the, it was a waste dump for rocks, the stones at the top of the comuna, right? They still have not dug those bodies. They're still looking for those bodies. And then when the um, new social urbanism approach to violence took place, great, the homicides reduced. But when I went up to the comunas and I talked to people, now you had to ask permission to kill because the gang leaders, the Combos, did not want Medellin to be considered the most violent city in the world. So they decided you no longer kill, but what you do do, you extort, you sell the virginity of young girls, and the essentially the criminality with violence always as a threat behind it has continued and continues to this day. But this is considered urban violence, social violence. So again, we have a problem of how we understand these different violences. And then there's the violence that takes place with uh, linchamientos or lynching in, in Latin America, because there's a phenomenon that has grown up as people live in these situations of great insecurity, whereby anybody who offers security is looked upon as a savior um, of a sort. Um, and others take violence into their own hands and have actually do their own violence to lynch someone they think. I remember in Guatemala and where with Anango when the, a guy was lynched for stealing um, uh, a chicken in the market, right? And it was it's like the emotion that's behind the sort of living in the fear of these contexts is so high that uh, you know, violence becomes a, a, a way of sending meanings. No, we're not going to accept that anymore. And the reason why Beth Bukele is so popular in El Salvador is because it's so politically profitable to use insecurity to, uh, um, uh, to, to show that you're doing something for those people and gain votes in the process of some sort. And I was six minutes away from this photo, which is the casino, because then we have the social violences of the urban violences, and it's not political anymore, it's said, it's urban, social, and then we have drugs violences, right? Emergent, obviously, over the last few decades in the region. This is when the Zetas um, set light to a casino in Monterrey, and they kill something like 58 women who play in the casinos in the afternoon. And so now there's a kind of an explanation of, is all the violence really about drugs in Latin America? And so here we have this sort of another kind of way of looking at violence. And of course, you know, there's a lot of connection between violence and illegal accumulation, but does it explain all that we're trying to explain? And sorry, I've, there's something come here. Ooh, 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 ooh. I might need some help here. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, something's happened to the slideshow. And it gives you another break. <laughs> Keep thinking, you can't. Can't stop thinking. It's the. I was no but full back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More, more. Oh yeah, yeah. This one. Yeah, that's that one. That one. Yeah. So this one is because. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the reason I put this slide here, because I've gone through a number of violences, right? And how difficult it is in Latin America to be able to categorize these. And now because we have an extremely interesting um, a proposal from the new president of Colombia called Total Peace, we can actually put on the, on the kind of agenda, a, a usually problematic discussion as to well, what is criminal violence? What is social violence? What is political violence, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that will lead to the possibility we might think, actually, let's talk about violence as a phenomenon. But here, 
We have the Ilengaris who are now at the moment uh, in our, our peace talks in Caracas. Um, we have the FARC in the ones below uh, who were in the peace agreement of 2016. And then we have the Clan del Golfo, which is a criminal group. And what some people think that the guerrillas are also criminal groups because they've been involved in, uh, in drug trafficking as well. And so we don't seem to be able to have a kind of serious conversation. What is criminal and what is political here, right? And Petro is going to face precisely that problem because for some people, the ELN are just criminals. For other people, they have a history of a struggle for social justice, but yes, they then went into uh, drug trafficking. And the Clan de Golfo emerged out of the paramilitary. The paramilitary were actually supported by the Colombian state in many, or Colombian regional landowners in many parts of, of the region. And so when the paramilitary went into their peace talks, the issue is then, well, the groups that came out of the peace talks are, uh, well, you know, we fought for the state. We fought against the guerrillas. And now they went into various sort of criminal activities. So what we're having in Latin America is a blurring of these lines between, well, how do we define these things? You know, what actually in the end of the day is something political? It's, it's quite complicated because in Mexico, you will find that lots of those political assassinations were actually assassinations that took place with the connivance of political actors, mainstream political actors with criminal groups that actually getting rid of your opponent and using the local drugs trafficking group to do so is actually a way in which Mexican politics has evolved. And so here you have in this democracy, you have um, electoral elected politicians actually using violence. And where do we, how do we distinguish? How do we actually know what is going on here? You know, again, all our, all our sacred conceptions from political science, they don't actually seem to work very well. When you actually try to go into Latin America and try to find out, well, what exactly is going on here? So then political, social, criminal, or what I call chronic violence, because I think what we have in Latin America is actually chronic violence. And it's worth thinking about the violences that don't get talked about as much. They get sort of talked, they're, they're the violences, they, they get talked about, but they're kind of like considered lesser, I would argue, right? So it was in Latin America that the term feminicide was actually articulated. I remember in Guatemala and in Mexico, people suddenly began talking, it's only, we're only talking about the 2000s, right? Suddenly talking about the murder of women because they're women. So this is another recognition of a violence that has not been recognized. So, and then even still 2021, at least 4,473 women were victims of femicide. And there's two discussions, I won't go into it now, feminicide or femicide. And the idea is feminicide draws much more attention to the fact you're killed because you're a woman and femicide is like the opposite of homicide. So it might, it might be just you're a woman who's murdered, but feminicide draws attention, you're murdered because you're a woman. So there's a debate there. And then we have the fact that um, uh, the most dangerous continent in the world for trans people, right? Uh, Amnesty International just reported in uh, 2021, the region accounts for 70% of the 375 murders of trans and gender diverse people reported worldwide. And then we have, is this political or what is this? 200 environmentalists killed globally in 2021, three quarters of them from Latin America. Right, so this is really extraordinary. And I've just been in uh, with a group of Garifuna from Honduras who are now struggling against drug trafficking, but also against environmental abuse of their land. Um, it's the country where Berta Cáceres, a famous, you know, incredible woman who actually really fought against the dam construction and was assassinated for doing that. And this is going on, right, all the time in Latin America, because especially as Latin America still depends a great deal on its mining and its uh, raw materials. And this is a field of uh, where violence is used to determine what will be the outcome on who will control the land. So this chronification of violence has other aspects to it. Uh, this 2022 report just come out, right? Really shocking. One in 10 deaths of children and adolescents in the region are the result of homicide. Homicide is a leading cause of death among adolescents, 10 to 19. Five countries with the highest rates of homicide amongst children and adolescents worldwide are in Latin America. 
Two out of three children in Latin America experience violence at home. Remember what I said about what happens if you have violence in the intimate space and you grow into, in a household where you're experiencing violence, what that does to your vulnerable body and what that means for your you know, attitude towards your aggression, your natural aggression and how that can turn. And the prisons, the prisons in Latin America, there's been some horrendous massacres in Guayaquil the last couple of years, but also all the prisons are overflowing with people. They are places sometimes run by drug trafficking groups. Uh, often they are places just hell, right, where the overcrowding is actually, actually extraordinary. Prison violence is a, a, a horrendous violence. And this is a picture from way back when I, you know, in fact, that the, the story continues, which is when I was in Ch Chiapas. I've just been in Chiapas as well, so I kind of can put update what's going on. But this, I just remember so well, this indigenous woman from Palenque telling me how women, when you are pregnant, because there's no healthcare system, you have to walk down the hill for miles, right, to give birth. When you get to the clinic, you wait and wait. And there have been babies who died as a result of that. And so this notion that some bodies matter more than others, and that's a really important issue for how violence is addressed and whose, whose bodies matter. And then the potency of violence. I mentioned before about these, the messages that violence communicates. What I've seen in, in my years in Latin America is how the violences have mutated, how they have taken on different forms all the, all the time. Right? There was a moment when narco Manadeo selling drugs on the street in, in the communas of Medellin didn't happen. And then suddenly I noticed this was happening. And this was the difference between the young kids who were selling and their, the organized criminal groups, right? Because we tend to put all those in together and we don't ask enough, why are the young guys getting drawn into this? And what does that mean? But the drugs accumulation process, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, in Mexico is just like the performance of spectacular violence. The messages that are being sent all the time is called narco mantas, where you, and then where you hang a body on a bridge from a bridge to give a message to the other cartel. These are these are mutations of violences which are happening all the time. So when I talk about chronic violence, it's because I'm kind of interested in how chronic violence could be a different measure to just looking at homicides. And I see chronic violence as measured, yes, by intensity, number of homicides, you, that is included, but also by space. How does the violence reproduce across all those spaces? from that intimate space of the home, to the space of the street, to the space of the prison, to the space of the school, and to the space of politics itself. That, some, that violence reproduces across those spaces, it recruits, and it reproduces intergenerationally, it re reproduces over time. And so I've got a, a, a sort of idea of how one could look at chronic violence, um, and but this is a better way of communicating. So this was a meeting I had in Apatzingan in Caliente, and I talked to uh, a woman who told me a story. She said uh, she had to leave the home, her intimate space, the house, because her husband had beaten her yet one, just one more time, and she had to leave with her baby. And she decided um, she would go to the police, and she asked her mother, would you come with me? But the mother didn't want to come with her because she didn't trust the police. So she went alone and she told the policeman what had happened. The policeman took a liking to him and said, I'm going to come and visit you. She went to her mother's home and then the policeman came to visit and he was killed by the gang in the neighborhood. And then all the officers, all the group that the policeman was part of came to her house and destroyed it. When you think of that story and it's, just, it's a story amongst many, you realize the the way the violence reproduces from that intimate space, the policemen, their state agents, the, 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 the gang of the barrio of the neighborhood is the, the street violence of the neighborhood. So we have there the way these, these violences are reproducing and gaining momentum and the potency of those violences and the messages that are being communicated, right? That the gang killed a policeman to tell, you know, you don't control this, you're not coming here, not because they wanted to save the woman. So conclusions. Right. What then can we learn? So the interaction of politics with violence is much more complex than I think 
that we get, we think about are much more complex than Weber thought about at the beginning of last century. Um, and in fact, violence isn't reducible just to political factors, but obviously the form of politics can enhance the reproduction of violences and its chronification. When it becomes, the violence becomes a form of accumulation of power and money and interact with, interact with abuses the vulnerable social body. So we've got a kind of politics that is constituted by the ongoing use of violence in which accumulation processes of both money and political power are embedded in these histories of the reproduction of violence. The vulnerability of the body enhances through the, it grows through the intergenerational cycles of violence, the traumas, the attachment, the ruptures, the abandonment, particularly on young men. And in turn, inequality has a particular correlation with violence, not poverty. And I always tell this story, some people will have heard it many times, but it just sums us all up so well. My PhD student, Adam Baird, who interviewed an assassin, a sicario in Medellin, and he asked the sicario, the assassin, if you weren't an assassin, what would you do? And the young man thought for a minute, and then he said, hmm, I'd be a bank manager. So it says quite a lot about being a bank manager, but it also says that a young kid from the poorest areas of Medellin is never going to have the status, the money, the respect. He can get them, though, by being an assassin. And so that idea of masculinity as involving respect, which you know, Philip Bourgeois and others have written about, I think is so fundamental for understanding what, it, what this form of masculinity in Latin America means. I've just been in Apatzingam with some of the young guys who are kind of involved in these things. It's so very clear to me that that is going on. And there's a horrendous statistic at, again, I'm using statistics. I've just said I wouldn't, but anyway, this one is probably the one I hate most and I use it a lot because it just communicates again. You know, there's a one in 50 chance of dying before you meet, thir reach 31 if you're a poor young man from Latin America. So there is a crisis of youth and masculinity. And the issue is, you know, what, what can we do about it? Um, and the inequality, right, is obviously a major factor. And we know that Latin America has, is one of the most highly unequal regions of the entire world, along with sub-Saharan Africa. But how does, how does inequality generate violence, right? And that's why I think the masculinities and inequality kind of helps to understand what it means when you're never, never going to be anything in the world. You're never going to have respect. And also where you don't have a horizon of time. If you think I'm going to die when I reach 30 odd, I'm going to live well for 30, you know, then I'll die. You know, that is not a way of which people are going to like start investing in life in their society. And then we have the, these issues that I've been talking about. But I wanted to sort of end on this issue, which is, for me, the issue really is about wealth and not poverty when we're talking about violence. And it is about why is it that elites and those that are accumulating wealth illegally through violence, why is it that the rule of law is not a path they want to take? Why is it that that is not the way they want to go? Um, and this issue of status and of control and of kind of being somebody this is the whole idea about what I call the dominant principles of domination that the elites contest with each other. But it's not just the criminal elites. It is the fact that I've been doing a lot of interviews with very globalized economic elites for whom violence doesn't touch them unless something happens like the casino in Monterrey when the Grupo de Dies, as they're called, a very uh, powerful group, they uh, suddenly couldn't go to their, their farms or go to Texas to shop because of fear of kidnapping. And then they acted, but they don't act normally because it doesn't touch them. They can buy their security and they can protect themselves. And so here there is, you know, those ideas that we need to think about, you know. So just to end on these three themes of Weber, right? Because, okay, so where have we got to about monopolization? Much more complex idea than in the original Weberian imaginary, right? Because in Latin America, the state diffuses violence. Right, we have political and criminal elites, I've already mentioned, are involved in violence diffusion. We have, apart from that, and I haven't been able to go into detail of all of this, we have histories of death squads, vigilante groups, paramilitaries, militias. Is it possible instead 
of a monopolizing, violence monopolizing state to think of a violence reducing state? Is it possible to give a sort of totally different take on what the state's role is? This is Brazil, where this year there's been some horrendous violence by militias going in. They control quite a lot of the poorest areas of Rio's favelas, and they go there and they have been killing kids. Legitimacy, the other dimension of Weber's uh, ideas. Ill-defined in Weber, it's one of his weakest concepts, in my view, and others. Um, that legitimacy for some is equated just with acceptance, right? Oh, if, if I believe, that's what they were using, you, know, you believe in the right of the state to use violence, that makes that violence legitimate. But we have no kind of outside way of deciding, or objective way of deciding, well, what makes that acceptance legitimate? Acceptance comes from all sorts of things. It comes from fearing what would happen if I didn't accept the local gang as my arbiter you know we have a debate amongst latin americanists on let's call it criminal governance i don't really like that very much because it feels to me that you know there's a lot going on here about um what actually means to have to accept armed groups in your neighborhood authoritarian citizenship is what i call the the way people begin to deny the rights of others in the name of their own um uh, uh, security and how that is used polit politically and I think that way that security becomes a politically profitable tool is what we see a lot in Latin America. Legality, I can't go into this in detail. They really are my last slide. Legality, impunity is obviously a real factor as well in the reproduction of violence, which is why this issue of the rule of law does matter. Um, and why don't elites in Latin America invest in the rule of law is a big question. And then territory. I think the other aspect of Weber's sort of approach Look at the territory in Latin America and you'll find, well, I've just been talking about the environmental activists, the extraordinary battle over territory and also over land. Land is a, is a, is a symbol of status and it's an investment. And actually, it's one of the factors which made it so much more difficult to bring about any discussion on violence or of a state that reduces violence. So I think, therefore, to end on a more positive note, <laughs> <laughs> Despite all that I've said, Latin America is a region which stands out for me for all the efforts in society to de-sanction, as I call it, right, to stop the acceptance of violences, right? It becomes really difficult to do it, and people have lost their lives doing it. But from the mothers of the disappeared, who I worked with a lot in the 1970s and 80s under the dictatorships, to the feminist movements of today, uh, efforts to create peaceful civic movements for change. There's a wonderful idea from Clara Judith Mann from Ciudad Juarez, uh, talking about Ciud Ciudad Juarez, about how you could create an e a care economy, an economy de cuidado. And so, and we have lots of new experiments in policing. And so, you know, yes, it's grim. And we have to start rethinking what we mean by violence to be able to embrace all the phenomena that are taking place and all the expressions of the phenomena that are taking place. But we have Neo and I Menos, you know, the feminist movement, not one more woman to be killed. And then this is my, really is my, my last slide. I arrived in Bogota uh, a few years back and a woman had just been impaled in the park, the National Park of Bogota. And I thought, will the society respond, right? She'd been impaled by a, a guy who you know, raped her, et cetera. I thought, will the, the society is so used to so much violence and all the human rights organizations tended to work on the violences of the war. I thought, will this violence make, make any, you know, grab any attention? And I think one of the most amazing moments of my life was when on the Sunday I went to the Parque Nacional in Bogota, the National Park, and I found it full of people. And these guys were doing a, a theater, an act of what it means to be the masculinities that lead to that kind of violence. And so I, you know, I think there is ongoing struggles of that kind, which are incredibly important for the future. And we just got to visualize them and make sure we, we notice them. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the very inspiring and interesting um, lecture. And um, again, I can only apologize for all the technical hiccups and this is why we're running really late now. Um,
but we do want to, um, I, I would love uh, for you to stay a couple of minutes longer um, so we can engage in the discussion. Um, and I to pick the microphone and switch to this microphone um, so that we can actually hear your questions um, and the online audience can hear your questions. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them now um, and we'll collect a couple. Um, or thoughts, comments. Um, you can, I think, also go back to the questions that were posed in between the yeah. blocks yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So, freedom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, my in way you can get. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and for taking the time to talk to us about this. Um, here, I think a lot of us think and talk a lot about conceptions of violence that include phenomena that don't show a very clear um, sort of intentional perpetrator. So uh, structural violence, for example, epistemic violence. And uh, I was wondering how you feel about that. Do you think that your conception of this phenomenon would include that kind of thing? Or do you think, because when we talk about masculinities, for example, we talk a lot about the psychology and the, the social persona of the perpetrator, right? And much less maybe about the victim and what happens if the perpetrator isn't just one person. Where is it? Hi, Jenny. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm still thinking about the first question that you put up, and and about if this, um, if the mon monopoly of violence is uh, a solution or part of the problem. And um, I have the, this idea that we tend to uh, to to go towards this because we feel that we didn't do this properly because we didn't went through or because there is a different way to do it. And um, especially when we compare Latin America to other, especially European countries, we think, okay, we didn't manage to do in the same way that they did. So if we manage to do it, then we will have the same kind of peace or at least uh, some kind of balance the way that they, they have. So uh, if, uh, because we think in an, almost in an evolutionary, evol evolutionary way, and that we are still behind in this and in, in this um in this pace so um i i just it's not exactly a question but more like a thought about this uh, idea if there is different ways to do this or if there is just one way oh. yeah no absolutely great questions and uh, i you know very happy with both of them because those both those points are very much in my head so Structural violence has been politically incredibly important to draw. Galtung, right, obviously put something on the map, which makes us, you know, it makes us recognize how much violence takes place embedded in structures that I would look upon, for instance, a child who dies of malnutrition. Uh, that's that's somatic harm, right? Bef you know, and that malnutrition should not be there. My problem with structural violence is that I think it's led people to sort of evade the issue of how violence actually affects the body, right? In the name of addressing structures, which for me is inequality is the structure, right? That's not the violence. The inequality is the structure. And we have to deal with, with that. Masculinity is, you know, we have to deal with how, we under, how masculinity is understanding, how it correlates to violence. But once I start saying it's structural, I almost sort of start to avoid actually understanding um, what is happening in the everyday. And it's so easy for people to say, well, in the name of dealing with the structural violence, I will use violence, right? And so if we, if we want to do something about all violences, it feels to me violence cannot be the, 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 the means, right? We have to find a way of kind of overcoming that sense even though I totally get what is meant by and why politically it becomes so valuable to talk about structural violence but I've just been 
a little bit worried about how the term structural violence tends to you know, not draw attention to the actual harm, direct harm on the body, right? Which, as you say, doesn't have to be intentional in the, in every, in the kind of overt sense, you know, because, but harm on the body, and this is why I like Bourdieu's symbolic violence, because Bourdieu, he talks, you know, about the woman who has been always subjugated as uh, in the household can often end up trembling in herself and won't speak because she, she's, her body has been so impacted by that sense of I'm worthless. That seems to me to sort of work really well, because, work really well, because it draws attention to those physical bodily effects. And I suppose I'm very interested in putting those, that embodiment, and I consider the psychological impact to be part of the embodiment in why violence reproduces itself. And for me, you know, I'm not against using structural violence, but I just feel it weakens the discussion about the phenomenon and that we need to strengthen de this day and age that. Which brings me to your question, which is also extremely important, which is, that, OK, we have this reference point, which could say, oh, gosh, well, at the end of the day, Weber gave us this, this place and look, Europe managed to do it, you know. <laughs> but I've been trying to use a lot of examples from Europe to show that actually you know, I didn't use the historical ones, but I could have done, you know, uh, you know, how over time what this this actually meant, this process of monopolization. Right. But also, um, you know, for me, it's it's incredibly in, important that actually violence persists in Europe. Right. There's still violence. And that's why I don't like the sort of quantitative way of looking at that, because there are parts of society in Europe which live violence and violence um, explodes every so often. You know, we talked about migrants, but, you know, there are now processes going on in England where what's called county lines. So you get lots now of young guys getting drawn into taking drugs into um, different parts of the country with knife crime becoming a huge issue, right? And that's another issue which we haven't talked about. I mean, the problem, one of the problems in Latin America is guns are so readily available and so much of the violence is actually guns. But in England, you know, it might not be guns, but it's knife crime. And it seems to me also when you look at language and violence and you look at social media and you look at hate crime and you look at all these other aspects of hurting the body of the other, we have that problem too, right? Which is, isn't to say it's better that we have... Um, two murders per 100,000 rather than 28 on average. But those two still tell us a great deal. And I think they still tell us about how our politics, you know, still is constituted by a failure to address violence. And I think that is true as well in terms of how we see the rest of the world, you know, how we actually kind of understand these violences going on. The fact is because Mexico is in the OECD, okay, it's not at war, this isn't violence. So for me, you know, Obviously, there are attempts now in the international sphere to try and address these violences, but it doesn't feel to me that we can sit, sit back and think, oh, it was fantastic what happened in Europe. I mean, it did do some important things, as I've recognised, but it, for me, if we don't start having a broader debate, right, um, you know, then we will actually end up with us using violence, which in a way... Uh, it's again, it's an interesting issue, whether it's structural, but I think letting migrants die in the sea is exactly in Europe, the place which is supposed to have dealt with violence, letting 10,000 migrants die in the Mediterranean. You know, it's, it's so extraordinary that that has happened in Europe. And that's our insensitivity when it comes to politics, because at the end of the day, Brexit happened in my country because, oh, the migrants are the problem, right? And our, the government still uses that. So let's send them to Rwanda. Doesn't matter what they've experienced, what they've suffered, or what happens has happened in Rwanda. And so, you know, these violence still is a is a is a tool for politics and for political, you know, gain. And uh, that still kind of worries me in Europe. Um, and so I don't sort of feel that the fact that we that Latin America Africa and other places haven't monopolized in that barbarian sense, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's part of a broader problem, which I think is that at the end of the day, Weber's understanding requires revision. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions in the room. Um, doesn't seem like it. We're also very much over time. <laughs> um, so I don't know, if maybe due to that, because I think uh, surely this was very inspiring and has pro um, it's going to. Um,
we're going to think about this a lot um, still and your questions and I think it's a lot of food for thought Good. um so thank you so much for and anybody wants to write to me with a question or comment I'm always happy yeah <laughs> wonderful um oh yeah I should do that Yeah, thank you again, um, Jenny Pierce. And um, please come back next week. Uh, we have Judith Vorrat um, from the SVP, and she will speak about illicit economies and violence. Um, so yeah, do join us next week and have a good evening. So did it get transcribed? <laughs>